towns and villages there. And they say another three people were killed in an eastern town called Konstantinovka by a Russian missile attack. That is just up the road from the embattled city of Bakhmut, scene of more than seven months of deadly warfare. Russia's war machine appears to be losing momentum in Bakhmut, where Ukrainian commanders now exhibit optimism. After hurling themselves for months against Ukrainian defenders in this city on Ukraine's eastern front, Russian troops and mercenaries have made only incremental gains and suffered staggering losses. Russian forces in Bakhmut are depleted, says one of Kyiv's top generals, and a Ukrainian counteroffensive could soon be launched. Harder to judge, the enormous sacrifice Ukrainians have made in their costly defense of this embattled city. But while Russia's efforts have slowed, they haven't stalled. Ukraine claims the area has been hit with more than 200 strikes in the last day alone. And Russia is sending in backup to compensate for the growing losses of Wagner private mercenaries, with Russian airborne troops now playing a greater role in the fighting around Bakhmut, according to the Ukrainian military. I want to say that the situation in the south has not improved. In such a way we can talk about some kind of victory or anything like that. On the contrary, the enemy is applying even more pressure. President Volodymyr Zelensky earlier this week paid tribute to the defenders of Bakhmut, visiting Ukraine's eastern front to hand out awards. The deadly grudge match over Bakhmut is far from over. The Ukrainian military says it's using the front lines of Bakhmut to bleed and exhaust the Russian army. But how long can Ukraine afford to fight a bloody war of attrition against its much larger, stronger enemy. Aaron, amid all of this uh, grinding fighting, we've gotten word of an exchange of sorts. The Ukrainian authorities say that the Russian military handed over the bodies of at least 83 killed Ukrainian soldiers and that Ukraine handed over an undisclosed number of very seriously wounded Russian troops. The Ukrainians are not calling this a prisoner exchange, rather they're calling it a repatriation uh, that they say they have to do according to international law. Uh, it just goes to show that amid the carnage and the killing that is going on day and night on the front lines, uh, there are still some areas of cooperation between Kyiv and Moscow. Aaron. Mm. Ivan, thank you very much from Zaporizhia tonight. And I want to go now to Alina Polyakova, a Russian foreign affairs expert and the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis, along with retired U.S. Army Major General James Spider Marks. And General Marks, I just want to begin with you. Uh, you know, Ivan talking about this fighting in Bakhmut. Uh, Russian forces clearly are depleted there. You're not just hearing that from Kyiv. It's visible uh, on the front lines. So we understand Russia sending more of these airborne troops uh, and that they're going to put them there. Now, I know you've had a lot of experience dealing with Russian airborne troops uh, in your time in Europe. So does what does that say to you? Well, the Russian airborne troops are, they, they paint themselves, just like American airborne troopers, as a pretty elite group. And let's be frank, it is. It's an additional step, and it's an additional qualifier that's required in order to join that unit. But once that unit is planted on the ground, their capabilities are not dissimilar to other units that would be there. They just, in many cases, would get there by jumping out of the back end of an aircraft. In this case, in Bakhmut, they won't do that. They'll deploy by trucks or by other means, or they'll walk in. But what I think it, it demonstrates is that with the airborne troops there, it really is a reinforcement. I don't see this as a relief in place. In other words, that the Wagner group is going to withdraw and then that the airborne troops are going to take their place. That is a very, although it seems very simple, it's a very complicated military operation so that you don't create gaps and vulnerabilities. But I think what the Russian forces are trying to achieve is that this is where they want to make a stand. These airborne troops are there, and this is where they intend to fight. And we've seen what the images look like, and we see what the reports in terms of losses on both sides. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, the incredible loss that this has been for Russia. So if they're putting in more elite forces, I mean, what that says in all ways. We also saw, of course, Alina, the recruitment video, right, uh, that Prigozhin put out. And, uh, you know, in this context, anyone who is now opposing the war in any way, we're seeing 
more and more response to it, right? Whether being in prison or poisonings or falling out of windows. And I want to play more of what Elvira told us about how concerns for her safety uh, worry her and even for her parents. Here she is. I have absolutely no guarantee for my safety from an objective standpoint. The most important thing is that there are two hostages in this country, my own parents. They're in a completely different city. There's a rather broad range of actions that could be applied to them. I know a lot of people who don't share the Kremlin's views and they have no guarantee of safety because the repression machine is rolling along with maddening speed. And of course, Selena, you know, she says that they were able to confirm that there were, you know, four and a half milligrams of this poison in her system. I mean, what does this say to you about how bad things are for anyone who speaks out in Russia right now? Well, Elvira's case is certainly, you know, absolutely heart wrenching, but unfortunately, it's not unique. Yeah. Uh, as you've reported many times on your program, Aaron, I mean, the list of those who speak out against the regime, who call Russia's war in Ukraine exactly what it is, which is a war, now face really increasingly brutal consequences. It's harassment of your family. Nothing is really off the table. Um, children are being taken from their parents in the case of that in Russia as well, of a little girl who uh, drew a picture at 12 years old of a Ukrainian flag uh, with the word war um, in the picture. And she was basically taken from her father. Uh, it's really approaching a state of repression, censorship, um, and just, you know, really deep, um, I think, dictatorial type tactics that look very much like a place like North Korea um, or Belarus. I mean, this is what Russia is today. And the risk of speaking out is incredibly high. And General Marx, when Alina talks about repression, Elvira also told us about how bad the repression has gotten as she sees it there, you know, talking about what they will do to track down any critic. Here's what she said about that. They come to some people at 4 a.m. They come to do searches, knocking down doors with sledgehammers. They ransack, turning the whole house over in an attempt to find some documents discrediting the authorities, or I don't know, to find some opposition signs. I mean, General, this is what they're spending time doing, day in and day out, knocking on doors 4 a.m. with sledgehammers. Doesn't sound much like a republic, does it? It sounds very much like the Soviet Union that we grew up with for 40 to 50 years. Look, the, there's criminality across the board in terms of what the Russians are doing in Ukraine and to their own people. Uh, there's no form of dissent. And then when you take this to a military perspective, what young man or woman, what young man in the Russia case would want to fight for this type of an autocratic regime where it's feckless leadership, it simply is a matter of following orders and not understanding the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. It's, it's blind loyalty, which is very, very dangerous. And Alina, the context here is there's now some reporting, this is from Bloomberg, that the U.S. is ramping up its investigation of Swiss banks uh, that they say may be helping Russian oligarchs evade sanctions, right? So we're more than a year into this war and you've still got Swiss banks possibly essentially assisting oligarchs uh, if this is how this pans out. We know Switzerland is long a playground for Putin's inner circle. Uh, the reported home of his ex-wife, Lyudmila, was there, right, within, uh, we, you could see it from Davos, where the, the world's uh, elite uh, met recently. The Wall Street Journal says that Putin's girlfriend, mother of his children, Alina Kabaiva, lives in a high-walled mansion near Geneva, or certainly has at one point. And Switzerland even acknowledged nearly $50 billion of Russian money in Swiss banks. That's what they're acknowledging. How, how big is this, I guess, this safety zone, Alina? Well, exactly as you said, I mean, Swiss banks in particular have a reputation and they've been quite notorious because of the kind of anonymity they provide to their clients um, in being known as a safe harbor for dirty money, money that is uh, being laundered, money that is stolen, in this case, from the Russian people. And it's been a known fact that many Russian oligarchs who are trying to Keep, stay safe, basically, and keep their money out of the hands of their own country, out of the hands of Mr. Putin in particular, have been hiding it um, in Europe, uh, but particularly in Switzerland. Unfortunately, there are many Western financial institutions that are likely involved in this. Switzerland is, is really the hot spot for it. But I think what's really different now is that the Department of Justice is taking this very seriously in a way that we haven't seen before. Mm. And uh, to the extent to which they're also uh, investigating 
Western wealth managers for potential wrongdoing. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, right, and, and how serious these sanctions are uh, more than a year after this invasion. Thank you both so very much.